afternoon. It's Tuesday, the 27th of June, 2017, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Mike Robinson, and joining me today, Patrick Henningsen in the studio from 21st Century Wire. Uh, thanks for joining us. Great to be with you, Mike. Um, we'll get straight into Grenfell Towers, Patrick, because, uh, of course, we still don't have any uh, official acknowledgement of the number of people uh, who have been killed in this incident, uh, who has been rescued, who's receiving uh, funding and who isn't. We'll come on to a bit of that in a second. Uh, but we still get some clues because over the weekend, uh, Diane Abbott suggested uh, a number. Uh, and then David Lammy on uh, Newsnight last night was saying, uh, you know, what people say is that if you put numbers out early, there could be civil unrest. That's what they say. I'm sympathetic to that view. I'm going to walk alongside these people. He said, the truth is that the media cycle is now beginning to move on to other things. That's the truth. And so what people say that is that in two or three weeks' time, if you start revealing the numbers, things have moved on. Uh, and he then went on to make the point that in one flat alone, people say there were up to 40 people gathering because they gathered uh, there for Ramadan. Uh, and he also discussed whether he thought there was a, a cover-up and, and the numbers. He said, I've never said that there was a cover-up, but I've listened to the survivors and the community, and I hear their concerns. I've listened to them explain how 79 is an impossibly low number, uh, how they want some closure uh, so that they can begin to grieve. And he said, I will listen to these people. I will stand shoulder to shoulder with them. They must be heard, and their concerns must be heard, uh, but they're not being heard, Patrick. I think we can go, we've gone a little further than David Lammy uh, immediately in the aftermath of this incident. Mike, we said it was a, there is a cover-up. And so there, I, I think there's definitely a cover-up. Uh, I believe that they're definitely downplaying the number of dead. Uh, and so this is politically convenient right now for so many people. Uh, and what do you think of the view uh, that Lamy's expressing here that, that they, they have done this in order to prevent civil unrest? Is, that, is, there, is there something in that or is this, uh, is this a bit of rhetoric to sort of let some people off the hook? Well, uh, it, it could be viewed as a, as a bit of rhetoric, Mike, but there is actually some truth in that statement by David Lamy. Because if you consider uh, how unpopular government is in general, uh, and, you know, they talk about all these governments in the media right now around the world decrying the populist movements around the world uh, as if this has nothing to do with the lousy job uh, that central governments have done in representing the interests of the people uh, whom they pretend to govern for so long. So there is some truth in David Lemmy's statement. The, the, the shock value from, like, say, coming right out of the gates and saying what their true number is, let's just throw a number out there, 300 uh, or 280 or something like that. Uh, th that could trigger off uh, more unrest, let's say, than a number like what they initially came out with, I believe, Mike, was 12. Yeah. 12 was the initial number. So there's some truth in what Lammy said there, but that doesn't uh, uh, excuse the government from covering it up because the worst part of what they're doing by kicking the can down the road, Mike, is exactly what uh, the MP from Tottenham is alluding to, is that people cannot grieve. You cannot get closure uh, when you're only giving a, a portion of the story. So that's why it's important. I think I think Britain's grown up enough they can take the, the, the true death count, right, Mike? Well, I would have thought so. So uh, kicking the can down the road. Uh, does that mean that when the number does finally, I mean, he's obviously suggest, suggesting that the uh, the news agenda will have moved on, but but for the community there, uh, their agenda won't have moved on. Uh, no. And so I'm not convinced that uh, kicking this can down the road actually helps no, uh, defuse the situation no. at all. It helps the government, and especially if you consider what's happened over the last week, Mike, mm. uh, a, a new government being sworn in, opening... Queen's uh, opening speech, opening of Parliament, and, and all the controversy around that. It absolutely benefits the government to downplay this, but it doesn't help the people at all. This issue's not going to go away with the people of West London. This is a very tight-knit community. Uh, this is unlike any other community, unlike any other community, bar maybe a few others, parts of East London and maybe Brixton and uh, Stockwell and places like that. There, there is no tighter community than West London. Um, okay, so uh, the Express here with what they claim is an exclusive. Uh, Grenfell Tower was riddled with asbestos, uh, which blew over neighboring homes. Yeah, so this is what people had suspected. We talked about this, I think, as well uh, on previous shows or on the Sunday Wire. Uh, Mike, so this is conf confirmed. Every single flat and the airing cupboards 
Okay, and now if that's the case with Grenfell Towers, Mike, what about all the other tower blocks in London? What about all the other tower blocks in the country? The focus right now, Mike, is on flammable cladding, um, flammable plastic uh, cladding that was put on all these tower blocks to make them not look like eyesores and uh, lift the overall property values uh, in the areas where they're located, but also to supposedly to supply uh, insulation, but also in reality, Mike, to keep water from getting into the concrete so the metal rods mm. won't sort of expand and large chunks of concrete won't fall to the ground and kill people. Uh, we learned that from the BBC documentary. Yes. So uh, there's lots of reasons to put this cladding on, but uh, the, the asbestos, Mike, this issue is the big elephant in the room. Nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to deal with it. Okay. They just let people languish in their asbestos-ridden council flats and hope that uh, no one figures out that some people might be dying of cancer because they're being exposed to asbestos for most of their lifetime. Okay, so this is, this is a difficult situation because uh, we've got the fire risk, we've now got an asbestos risk, uh, and in the meantime in Camden, uh, as uh, many of the uh, mainstream media have been commenting on, but tension as uh, 200 residents refuse to leave tower blocks because uh, the local Housing Association attempting to forcibly remove them, uh, imposing what could be described as draconian dictatorial uh, identity checks on people coming in and out of the building. What is going on here? People need to pay very close attention to this particular story. This is the first story, Mike, of many, I predict. Okay, so what's going on? They've identified a few tower blocks in Camden as being a fire risk because of the cladding, the flammable cladding on the outside. This is going to happen all over the country, Mike. So what they've done, there's 200 residents that are holding out, do not want to leave. The rest are being forced to sleep uh, in a basketball gymnasium in Swiss Cottage, Swiss Cottage Sports Centre. If you're familiar with Finchley Road or North London, you'll know. Where, where, where that is, and it's not the best place to be staying. So some families have said, look, go ahead and remove the cladding, but we're going to stay in our flats. So is there anything wrong with that? Well, the council have hired private security and the rent -a cops and, and who else who are basically telling uh, the residents that you have to leave. Uh, this is a health and safety risk. They're intimidating residents, according to this report, by ham on high and according to other reports. So this is, Mike, what are we looking at here? This is a type of ultimate imminent domain, mm. whereby the state using this, and I think you might, you call this a cynical use of the health and safety crisis, mm. which was triggered by the Grenfell Tower fire. I think that's pretty accurate, Mike. Mm. I think that's what's going on. Very cynical use of this tragedy in order to have this carte blanche to basically pull people out of their flats in the middle of the night because someone deems it a fire risk. This is an interesting area we're going into here, Mike, and I want to say not a little bit uh, disconcerting. It's, it is disconcerting, and it's disconcerting uh, because what seems to be going on here, Patrick, is that the police aren't involved in this. This is private security firms. These aren't police. Uh, they're dressed are, like police. They're dressed though, like police, but they're private security firms. And if you remember, uh, when we produced that little documentary on the Kensington and Chelsea TMO, yeah. the people that burst into that gentleman's house were dressed like police, but they were the TMO's private security firm. And so what we're doing is uh, uh, being uh, conditioned to accept private security firms that are, the British man's home is no longer his castle, they can burst into your house and expect you to leave uh, because the council says so. Uh, and the population as a whole is being conditioned. And of course, if uh, middle classes are prepared to accept this going on with working class people in social housing, where does it end? It, 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 there is no ending to it. They can pull you out of anywhere. If, if someone could go in your flat, Mike, according to this dictate, and go and test your curtains, doesn't matter where you live, and if those curtains are somehow not flame retardant enough to whatever European ISO standard there is, then they'll take you out of your flat right there and your mm -hmm. kids, grab your clothes, you're going to the nearest gymnasium, netball gymnasium, mm -hmm. and that's where you're going to live for the next eight weeks. They said to the residents here, Mike, that it's going to take three to four weeks to remove the cladding from these council flats, but many of the residents have rightly said, more likely this is going to be eight weeks. I would say 
double that in mm -hmm. some cases, but probably 10 weeks, three months out of your home. Yeah. So what if you have a job? What if you have kids at school? You know, oh, they'll let you go back in your flat for one hour a day to go get essential goods, but then you have to leave and go back to the gymnasium. This is bizarre. Bizarre. No, uh, just before we move on to Sajid Javid, um, I think you wanted to make a, a point about uh, which political parties might be a little bit behind it, behind the whole Grenfell Tower issue, because uh, Labour, it, none of the mud seems to be sticking to them at the moment. No, and to be fair, Mike, you know, we, we came out with the, uh, the article in 21st Century Wire that the, uh, the Tory wicker man, Grenfell Tower. Yeah. And so, yes, the Conservative, the Tories do the feet, um, at their feet, lots of blame between Boris Johnson, uh, e between many of the uh, members of government who voted down on making uh, accommodation habitable, for instance, all the conservative private landlords and so forth. But this is also a labor problem. In fact, equal, if not more, ownership to this problem you could lay at the feet of the Labour Party, starting with New Labour, Mike. So we had some uh, a few bullet points there, but the whole TMO uh, revolution was part of the New Labour initiatives and, and really came into play in the late 90s during I, that time. I, I think what it shows is that there is no difference between the political parties in this. They're pursuing a, a separate agenda. It's not a political party or party political agenda at work here. So let's uh, let's bring uh, Sajid Javid in at this point because uh, uh, he has announced that the government is providing a million pounds uh, to support char the charitable response to the Grenfell Tower disaster. Uh, and this is on top of the uh, five, th five million pound uh, uh, interim fund that, that, that Theresa May has announced. Uh, so this million pounds is being, well, let's see what he said to start off with. He said that the residents of Grenfell Tower have been through some of the most harrowing experiences iman imaginable and the response from local charities and volunteers has been remarkable. I have to say, uh, you know, that is true to a large degree. Uh, the, the response on the ground from good people has been remarkable. But my question here is, uh, where is this million pounds going to go? So let's look at the organization that is going to be distributing this money. And this is it, uh, Locality. Uh, Locality has has the, uh, the, the task of distributing it. Uh, and I do wonder where this is going to go. Now, we published an article in 2013 on Locality. It's called Common Purpose in Your Locality. Get onto the UK column website uh, and have a read at this. Um, and uh, w a couple of the points that are made in this article, it says a visit to the Charity Commission website revealed uh, that Locality is a, comp as a company registered with the Charity Commission as Locality UK. Of its 10 listed trustees, there are com uh, three of them are common purpose graduates. Uh, and uh, it goes on to say that the Locality charity has already recruited what it called Kickstarter organizations. Uh, which are engaged to support the recruitment of community organizers uh, to act as local hosts. These Kickstarter organizations are right around the country, uh, including Bristol, Birmingham, London, uh, Hull, Norfolk, Cumbria, Manchester, Cornwall. Uh, and uh, again, the Kickstarter organizations direct links to common purpose. What they're talking about is at that, what they were talking about at that time was 5,000 full-time professional community organizers. Uh, and uh, the links between locality and common purpose are absolutely clear. And so, Patrick, the question has to be asked, where is the money going to go? It's not going to go to the local people on the ground supporting. It's going to go to the common purpose connected uh, NGOs and civil society organizations that have uh, a less than, uh, in many cases, a less than altruistic purpose. So tell me if this is a correct way of looking at this. So you have what seems to be a charity or some sort of NGO, but what it is, it's a government arm masquerading as some sort of a charity or community-based organizing uh, type body or something, right? Right, right. and it, what, it, what it, are it's, they... It's, it's made up of government-affiliated people. Uh, absolutely, and, 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 and what are they pursuing? They're pursuing the social change, the social engineering agenda, which Grenfell Towers absolutely represents because this whole gentrification I hate that word because it's it's a soft word. That's it's too soft for what's going on there. But these are the types of organisations that are pushing that policy. So this organisation is taking advantage of a, a, a massive human tragedy, Mike. And then so they're putting someone's offered up. The government's offered up one million dollars, right? So most people are going to look at this, Mike, and they're going to say, "Well, that's a good thing." 
It's a great, oh, the government's giving a million pounds to the community. This is the way it looks from the public optics. And so who's going to argue with that? And, you know, what sort of cynical person would challenge that, Mike? But what, what, what is this? Is this a payoff in terms of it's going to pay off third sector key people? Uh, it's going to identify leaders out of this crisis as well and maybe recruit them under the common purpose fold. Absolutely. Put them on leadership training courses, which cost 5,000 pounds a weekend or something like that's that. That's about that, yes. And, uh, and so that's tied aid because that money is already behind the scenes anyway. It's being earmarked. This is, this is all going to be spent on programs, Mike, uh, this is for, the way to train people or to bring up the next generation of common purpose leadership. Is that what's happening? Absolutely what's happening, yes. So. Yes, and I know some people are going to find this a little bit difficult, um, but the, the, over the weekend, uh, Joe Cox uh, had a memorial plaque unveiled by her children in the House of Commons. I don't think it's a coincidence that the background on the shield there is, is uh, purple and green, which are the, the colours of common purpose, because if you look at, what, of, at how the Joe Cox Foundation is spending its money, it's exactly the same type of thing. It's spending its money on these types of civil society organizations, aside from the fact that they're giving uh, millions, of, well, thousands or hundreds of thousands of pounds to the White Helmets. Uh, and, and, you know, but the other projects that they're also funding are exactly these types of civil society. Um, so Jill Cox, uh, her name has been hijacked. And maybe, maybe she believed in these kinds of organizations, but, but the foundation is spending money in areas that uh, perhaps we shouldn't... Uh, Leave that image back up for yeah. a second, Mike. What, what do you call the study of this sort of symbology? Heraldry. Heraldry. Yeah. So if there's any uh, of our viewers out there, UK column viewers can look at this image who might be um, you know, astute in, in the study of heraldry. Yeah. Tell us what the symbology of this shield is. Because certainly there's uh, an interesting design there. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, uh, apologies for not having a news program yesterday. We did have a technical issue in the studio. Uh, but yesterday uh, was International Day in support of victor victims of torture. Uh, and this is the United Nations. And they're saying torture seeks to annihilate the victim's personality and denies the inherent indignity of the human being. Uh, at this point, uh, you know, we've got we've to mention that Britain has been absolutely and still is involved in torture. Uh, we'll come on to that in a second. Uh, despite the absolute prohibition of torture under international law, torture persists in all regions of the world. Concerns about protecting national security and borders are increasingly used to allow torture and other forms of cruel, degrading and inhuman treatment. Uh, its pervasive consequences go beyond the isolated act on an individual and can be transmitted through generations to lead to cycles of violence. Well, this is what the United Nations had to say on this. Uh, and in order to celebrate uh, the International Day in support of victims of torture, they held an event at, the King, at King's College in London yesterday, uh, held jointly with the International Bar Association. Uh, it was a, a high-level panel discussion, uh, and uh, it was aimed, apparently, at reaffirming in these critical times the absolute prohibition of torture. Uh, and, uh, well... Let's see. What Look at how they're marketing this, by the way, Mike. So torture is only something that happens in Banana Republic, African countries, right? Right. Doesn't happen in U.S. black sites or British military detention facilities. Right. So let's see what the British government had to say. Oh, it, his name is not Johnny Appleseed, by the way. I do apologize. That is a placeholder for, for other texts. This is Lord Ahmad. Uh, and he said the U.K. government condemns torture in all circumstances and that he calls on governments around the world to eradicate this abhorrent practice. Well, it was only a couple of days ago that The Telegraph had this headline, U.S. interrogates det detainees at Yemen black sites rife with torture. Hundreds of men swept up in the hunt for al-Qaeda militants have disappeared into a secret network of prisons in southern Yemen uh, where abuse is routine and torture extreme, uh, including the grill in which the victim is tied to spit-like uh, a roast and spun in a circle of fire, and this is according to Associated Press. Uh, they're saying that there are at least 18 clandestine lockups, as they describe them, around southern Yemen, run by the UAE uh, or by Yemeni forces created and trained by the, by UAE. So, in other words, this is uh, US UK backed, Saudi backed, and Saudi backed. Yeah. Um, right. And uh, let's just remember, it's only a couple of months ago that the uh, Supreme Court uh, issued its judgment uh, on a case of 
uh, well, this is just one of many cases, but they have said here that, uh, that Jack Straw and everybody in the new Labour administration that was linked to this uh, have a case to answer uh, with regard to um, uh, Libya, uh, where um, a couple of people were kidnapped uh, in Thailand, taken back to Lib Libya and tortured in Libya, uh, and that British officials were involved uh, because they were questioning this person, that, the, the people that were being tortured, uh, and that the quest, some of the questions that were being asked were being formulated by MI6. So that, that was proved uh, in the spice, or at least agreed, that that took place by the Supreme Court just a couple of months ago. Uh, Britain absolutely complicit uh, in torture, uh, has been for many years. Nothing has changed despite our claims to the contrary. So maybe the UN should have the International Celebration of Torture Day. Maybe that would be more apt, I think. Uh, they could, you know, run clinics and stuff like Armed Forces Day. Yes. To teach kids how to do enhanced interrogation and things like that. Uh, so they do put the kids on the guns now on top of the tanks. You absolutely, see yes. Practicing being yeah. gunners and yeah. stuff like yeah. that. So. Um, right. Uh, Syria then. Uh, a statement from the White House. Here it is. For immediate releases came out yesterday. The United States has identified potential preparations for another chemical weapons attack by the Assad regime that would likely result in the mass murder of civilians, including innocent children. The activities are similar to the preparations the regime made before its April 4, 2017 chemical weapons attack. Uh, as we've previously stated, the United States is in Syria to eliminate the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. If, however, Mr. Assad conducts another mass murder attack using chemical weapons, he and his military will pay a heavy price. Uh, well, Michael Fallon, the Secretary of State for War, uh, has uh, uh, butted in on this and he has said the use of chemical weapons against in innocent civilians is absolutely uh, abhorrent. It's illegal under any rule of war. And Patrick, um, the first question I have in my own mind is uh, please explain to me what the difference is. Let's, let's, we know that Assad is not doing this, but even if he were, uh, what is the difference between Assad dropping a chlorine bomb on a couple of hundred people and uh, Britain and the United States leaving a layer of depleted uranium uh, in Iraq or in Afghanistan and killing, maiming millions of people. Uh, surely, who, who is the bigger war criminal here? Or dropping a Moab on a village or dumping white phosphorus uh, like the coalition did last week in uh, northern Syria. What's the difference between that and Assad's supposed chemical weapons? I guess because you suffer more uh, before you die uh, from a chlorine attack uh, than you do if your whole village is incinerated in one hundredth of a second by a Moab. Uh, that's the received wisdom anyway uh, in Western uh, neoliberal responsibility to protect R2P circles. So that's what I'm told, Mike, but it's not actually written down what this distinction is. I'm so. afraid I have to say that uh, Michael Fallon is a disgrace to humanity at this point. Well, so the use of chemical weapons against innocent civilians is absolutely abhorrent and it's illegal under any rule of war. Well, so is arming uh, internationally recognized terrorist groups, so is sending them cash, so is allowing them to come back to your country and giving them absolute economic support, political clout, uh, legitimacy, uh, removing them from the terrorist list after that in the case of al-Nusra Front and the groups like Arar al-Sham, that is actually against British law, European law, international law, US law. And that is what, that is the policy that has been uh, the policy of the UK, France, mm. United States, Norway, the Netherlands, and many, many, many other countries, including our GCC allies, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, and the UAE for the last seven years, Mike. So Michael Fallon, would be nice if you address some of those points before you're lecturing the world on the horrors of chemical weapons. Right, so let's get back to the, uh, the White House uh, press release. So uh, once again, do they think that, uh, that the, uh, the members of the public are so stupid as to once again believe uh, a, an intelligence report on the use of weapons of mass destruction mm -hmm. in a foreign country. Ha, have we not learned this lesson from 2003 onwards? It all sounds familiar. Just like, just like the torturing uh, from 2003 onwards or 2002 onwards, uh, it's the same old story again. Re just chemical weapons once again. What is it, Mike? 
What is it? Well, what it is is fake, Patrick. Mm. So this is interesting. This is this is the inspection by the moderate rebels. This is for the April. Uh, Th this is after the Conchahoun Sarin attack, uh, which supposedly took place in Idlib, which Michael Fallon's referring to there. Yes. And the White House press uh, secretary or the White House press statements refers to. This supposedly happened. This is what triggered the U.S. airstrike against Syria. And look at this. You've got these three people standing around pretending to be busy wearing rubber gloves. Well, actually and, sitting in the hole that the bomb is supposed to have made, right? And those are the $1 surgical masks, which you can buy at the pound stretcher. <laughs> so these are supposedly the sarin experts. Uh, deployed by the U.S. and Britain. By the way, the, uh, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons wanted to mount an independent investigation and two, into that attack. Yeah. Two countries blocked it, Mike, stood in its way at the U.N. Which two countries were they? Uh, well, take, a, take a wild uh, guess. I'll you, give you two, two guesses. The, I'll give you two chances. U.K. and U.S. Uh, Thank you. Winner. Okay, and uh, of course, uh, I believe at the time you said that this was a load of nonsense. Well, this is what we said at the time. Um, this is one of the more tame articles which we published at the time, but without any evidence. Trunch la tr Trump launches 59 uh, cruise missiles. Uh, only, I think, 23 of those actually uh, landed, by the way. But uh, to de destroy the Syrian uh, Air Force Base at Sharat Air Force Base in Homs. So we, we knew it was a hoax. Yes. When it happened, Mike, even though the media ran with this story and so enthusiastically. Well, we knew it was a hoax at the time, uh, but apparently Seymour Hersh now has come out and said that not only was it a hoax, but U.S. intelligence knew that it was a hoax. This is an amazing story, Mike. So, by the way, Seymour Hersh could not get this published in the London Review of Books. They spiked the story. So he had to go to the German publication here, Welt. I can't pronounce the full name of the uh, publication, Mike. Maybe you could help me there. But uh, so, so Hirsch is basically saying here, this can't be published in the U.S. None of uh, the New Yorker or any of his former employers won't touch it. London Review of Books won't even touch it because that's where Seymour Hirsch uh, published uh, debunking the t 2013 uh, East Ghouta chemical attacks, mm -hmm. sarin attacks, that the U.S. and Britain nearly went to war on the back of, okay, so here he is. Now, apparently, the Trump ordered the generals, uh, or I guess McMaster and Mattis ordered themselves to go ahead with the airstrike, even though they knew that there was not any evidence to suggest that Bashar al-Assad uh, had launched a chemical attack on his own people, much less a sarin attack. Uh, so that is according to Seymour Hirsch, award-winning investigative journalist, probably one of the top uh, people uh, in his field uh, who's alive today and this will this has been blackballed by the Western media this story so that that's according to Hirsch I have no reason to doubt Seymour Hirsch because he's been right about, about just about everything else uh, in his career so what did what did Trump gain from this at the time you got a bump in the polls okay uh, the media absolutely ran with this and this is regarded as Donald Trump's greatest achievement so far as president. And it's based on a fake. It's, it's a hoax. Yeah, but but, uh, and, but who, who considers this to be Donald Trump's uh, highest achievement? The Western media? Uh, the, West, the Western media does. And uh, even CNN and some of the neoliberal interventionists were lauding Trump at the time, saying, oh, he's finally presidential. Look, he's launched a cruise missile strike against the evil Assad. So this is all based on a lie. And, and just to just to make this point once again, um, do you think Trump is signing off on these things, or has he absolutely delegated this authority to McMaster and and Timerson and these kinds of people? According to the conversation we had with Daniel Faraci from Washington D.C. on the Sunday Wire just two days ago, uh, Trump has delegated all of these types of decisions to the Pentagon, basically, or the DOD, the Department of Defense. So. But so, so there's been a coup. There's a military coup, which Trump was voluntarily really handed over this power mm. to the military. He signaled this during the uh, campaign. He says, I'm going to, my generals will make all these decisions for me. Mm. And so that was sort of in lieu of his lack of political experience and so forth. Very dangerous move yeah. that Trump did by, by telegraphing that. But, um, so, but the point of this Hirsch story, Mike, is Trump had the knowledge. He had access to the intelligence that there was no uh, intelligence that, that 
said Assad launched chemical weapons against his own people. Trump knew this, and he allowed the attack to happen anyway. Yeah. So. Okay, well, um, Michael Fallon uh, has been in the news quite a bit in the last day or so, uh, and uh, in this case he was talking about the rise of Islamic State outside of uh, Iraq and Syria, uh, and uh, particularly he was talking about uh, in the Philippines, and uh, so he was given a, an interview to Sky News, I think, this morning, uh, and he was, he was asked about this. He said that it's a reflection of the success the coalition is having in helping Iraqi forces drive Islamic State out of Iraq. Uh, it's inevitable that you would see offshoots of Islamic State springing up in other countries. Uh, and he went on to say that uh, this is a worldwide terrorist phenomenon and we have now have to deal with it on a global basis. Uh, and the point here is, Patrick, the Phil you've made this point to me this morning before the program, the Philippines has had a, a, an Islamic insurgency for how many years? Um, it's, it's the world's longest running Islamic insurgency on the planet, Mike, 400 years. In, in total in the Philippines. So this didn't just pop up in the last couple of years. And they're not ISIS either, okay? They, ISIS is a brand like Al Qaeda. And all you need to do is put the patch on your jacket and print out the flag on your inkjet, put it on the back of the wall, film the video, and you're ISIS, basically. So there, are there any Arab uh, extremists or ISIS people in the Philippines? Maybe a couple. But overwhelmingly, this is a Filipino Islamic extremist phenomenon that's been going on for how long? 400 years. Yep. So I'm asking myself, what does Michael Fallon actually know? This is a good question. And so he's in charge of your defense. He's making this statement, which is completely ill-informed and taking things, blowing things out of context. Yes, if there is an ISIS uh, phenomenon in the world, it's probably mostly due to uh, the activities intelligence activities and the funding of the United States, its NATO allies, Saudi Arabia, and other GCC partners. That's what's driving, if there is an ISIS phenomenon, Mike, it's being driven by those factors, yeah. not by any sort of uh, grassroots uh, Islamic organization itself. But the one in the Philippines, Mike, uh, it's, it's kind of faux ISIS. It's like, because you know, if we, if we adopt the ISIS brand, we'll seem a bit more bad, hopefully gain some global support but are they ISIS? Not really. They're not definitely not Iraq and Sham. ISIS is, yeah, the Islamic State of Iraq and Sham, yeah, or yeah. the Islamic State of uh, in the Levant, yeah. which is not the Philippines. So. Yeah, indeed. Uh, right. So, so Fallon talking about the expansion of, of ISIS and so on, and how great uh, Britain is doing in supporting the United States getting rid of ISIS in Iraq and Syria. We're doing a fantastic job. Well, the BBC's uh, Middle East correspondent, of course, senior Middle East correspondent is Jeremy Bowen. Uh, and he has a series on uh, BBC Radio 4, which I happened to catch a little bit of yesterday afternoon. Um, and he was talking about the implications of ISIS being defeated in Syria and Iraq. Uh, and I just want to play a short clip of this. Think of the war in Syria as a deadly layer cake. The fight against the Assads is just one layer. Each foreign intervention adds another. The conflict between Kurds and Turks, shootouts between rebel factions, the proxy war between the Saudis and Iran. The most dangerous layers are being added now. One is what follows the campaign to destroy Islamic State's self-styled caliphate. President Obama restricted the US military to the fight against Okay, so, so Patrick, the, it's a layer cake. It's an evil layer cake, according to the BBC's senior uh, Middle East correspondent, Jeremy Bowen. Right, and so he then went on to say that uh, once ISIS is defeated in uh, Iraq and Syria, that uh, it would take a very little event to cause a more general conflict in the in the region, a much broader, more general conflict in the region. Uh, should we take that as perhaps a little bit of a threat? It, it does sound like a veiled threat. So in other words, if, uh, if Assad doesn't capitulate, uh, then we're going to start a multi-nation conflagration in the Middle East or an Arab on Arab war. Uh, so a little bit of a veiled threat there, it seems to me, from the BBC. So this, this whole proxy project uh, hasn't gone so well. And oh my God, shock horror, if Assad ever wins, that's just going to be the worst of the worst. 
But you know, he talks about this layer cake, this delicious layer cake. He describes all the layers in that beautiful Radio 4 style. Um, but uh, he doesn't say who's baking the layer cake, yeah, Mike. Yeah. And uh, so who's baking this cake? I guess it's a self-baking cake. Yes. All these things just happen organically. Just and, oh, it must be, must be the Arabs. You know, they've been doing it for years. The Shiites and the Sunnis. But who's baking the cake? Well, the chef is in Washington, D.C. He's in uh, Langley, Virginia. Uh, the chef is in London. The chef also has a franchise in Paris. Yes. The chef also has a, a franchise in Riyadh. And they all get together and bake this wonderful layer cake that, uh, but Jeremy Bowen doesn't want to talk about who's baking the cake. Yeah. He just wants to describe it. And great. Well, uh, I mean, you, know, you say all that, but uh, we've got to assume that, that that's not true, that in fact it's Russia that's building the layer cake, uh, because of course Russia is behind every event that happens in the West. Uh, it's behind uh, elections of uh, uh, presidents, it's behind uh, elections of prime ministers is behind all kinds of things. So uh, here we've got the independent claiming that Donald Trump has said that Barack Obama colluded by not pursuing Russia's election hacking. So Donald Trump now believes that Russia hacked the U.S. election. Is that correct? Well, th this this headline is spun here by the independent to give credence to the idea that Russia somehow hacked the U.S. elections, and as as I've said, and you, I don't know about your program, but from the beginning, we said that the whole Russia hacking the U.S. elections talking point narrative is a hoax. It never happened. There's more evidence that the Department of Homeland Security hacked U.S. election systems. Uh, just Google DHS uh, Georgia and uh, hacking U.S. election systems, and you'll see that evidence. Um, but the real uh, thing that this is all designed to do is to cover up the fact the person who was, the people, parties who were really involved in skewing the U.S. elections were the White House, was the Democratic Party, was the Democratic National Committee, was the Hillary Clinton campaign, was CNN, was ABC, NBC, New York Times, Washington Post, were all actively involved in colluding uh, to basically derail the U.S. 2016 elections. Mm -hmm. so, uh, th so they've made a fake story to protect the president, which is that Obama wanted to exact revenge on Putin, so Obama overplayed his hand with Russiagate and maybe took things a little too far, but he felt that he had to do something to punish the Russians for meddling, meddling in the U.S. elections. So it, it was first hacking, then it was downgraded to meddling, then it was downgrading to influencing, and now I think it's been downgraded to, uh, I'm not sure, I think influence is the sort of the, the bottom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so th th this is a fake, this is a completely fake story. But uh, Patrick, come on, the mainstream media would not create fake stories. Well, they wouldn't, but looks like they've done here once again. So CNN, three CNN journalists have resigned over a fake Russian uh, uh, Russia Gate story here. So this is amazing. Three have tendered their resignations. I think they've been asked to, they've been asked to be fired, <laughs> you know, whatever you want to call it. So I think there was probably a threat of a uh, defamation or a libel suit behind the scenes. This is certainly what it looks like. They named Anthony Scaramucci in this story here, and he was a close advisor to Donald Trump. Plus, he's a regular contributor on the Fox news network, very popular. So he was named, supposedly met with a Russian hedge fund or uh, investment portfolio manager and uh, al allegedly discussed lifting of Russian sanctions, which anybody can talk about. There's nothing illegal about that. Yeah. Everyone's speculating when are sanctions going to be lifted. Everybody wants to know. So they've been asked to leave CNN. And this is the amazing thing, Mike. They've issued this memo. Right. Well, just before we okay. get onto the memo, I just wanted to, to comment on the headline here, because this is USA Today's take on it. And it says CNN journalists resign over Russian story snafu. It was just a snafu. Just a mistake, Patrick. Yeah, it wasn't fake news. It wasn't fake news. It was just a, a mistake. So, yeah. That says to me that, that, <clears throat> Russia, uh, that US, USA Today and mainstream media actually pretty... Uh, concerned about this story. They're wanting to downplay it as much as possible. Yeah. But you've just mentioned a memo. Yes, this, this is unbelievable. Here's a, it's a, tr a tweet that came out from Mark Amos uh, about this story. So the email went out. And so Rich uh, Barbieri, who's the executive editor of CNN Money, no one should publish any content involving Russia without coming to me or uh, Jason Farkas, who's the CNN's vice president. So basically all the way up to the vice president level, at CNN, Mike, if you're doing any Russian stories, has to go through head office at CNN. They're scared. 
there was some major legal threats here. Mm -hmm. So this is going to change editorial policy at CNN from this day forward, I guarantee it. And do you think that would uh, uh, affect other mainstream outlets? It, it could, but what this is, a, what, what else is, this is going to send shockwaves through the media, but this is also going to be used uh, to the benefit of the White House, who've had this sort of um, adversary relationship with CNN uh, for quite some time now. So this is giving them a lot of leverage, Mike. So CNN is really on their back heels. They're making an absolute feast out of this right now in the right-wing media in the United States right now. Okay, but uh, sticking with Russia then, because apparently the British Parliament was hit by a cyber attack as what Russian hackers attempted to uh, get into email accounts uh, belonging to British MPs. Is that, is that well, what's going well, on? Well, they think it's Russia, Mike, and why that's a, that's in. You might as well say it's Russia. If, if, if you can't figure out who actually did it, just say that Russia did it. So uh, 90 email accounts in Parliament, which I assume have the highest level of all possible security on the planet. So who else could do that but Putin yeah. and his crack team of hackers in the basement somewhere. Of the Kremlin? In the, in the, or somewhere in St. Petersburg or something. Who knows? Uh, but the register being a bit more uh, sensible about this, perhaps? Well, quite rightly, because they're, they're saying this was a brute force hack. So if this was a brute force hack, then it would have to get through t uh, basically a two-step identification process, which most governments and corporations have, this uh, two-step ID apps that uh, in order to get through that, you need, to, it's not impossible, Mike, but it's difficult, mm -hmm. okay? So to hack 90 of these, uh, you would have probably more likely had, so what, what the register is saying is either they didn't have two-step identification protocols at Parliament or it was optional. And worse, some MPs and people in Parliament opted not to use two-step two -step identification because of convenience. Maybe it's faster when you're on your iPhone in the pub at lunch. You don't need to do two-step ID. You can just log on real quick. So they're vulnerable to basic hacking at that point. So not even state-sponsored level hacking for anybody could sort of do the job. Um, well, um, we should all be very proud uh, because the new British aircraft carrier, the Queen Elizabeth, has set sail. Um, and uh, it uh, lots of photographs in the media about it just squeezing underneath the uh, fourth bridge uh, by six inches uh, because it's such a big ship. Uh, this is what we're being. Uh, this is what's being presented. But unfortunately, uh, there were so many images uh, of this ship pushed out by the Ministry of Defense, uh, that some bright sparks noticed that uh, the computers on board HMS Queen Elizabeth are running Windows XP, uh, which of course is unsupported by Microsoft. And, uh, and uh, all the, if you remember uh, a few weeks ago, the ransomware attack on the National Health Service, that was all Windows XP computers that were, uh, so, so the question is being asked, are the Russians gonna hack the HMS Queen Elizabeth? Uh, and, uh, well, I mean, I would imagine they are because they're hacking just about everything else, as we yeah. know. Why don't we just say the Russians did it before it happened? Before it happens, yes. So if it does happen, we're just saying ahead of time, Russia did it. Uh, okay, so, so the Ministry of Defense, very, very proud that this ship has set sail. Of course, as you can see, there are no aircraft on deck because the F-35s have been grounded again this, this past week uh, for, for various other things. So that's an aircraft carrier. Let's take a look at that. It's an aircraft carrier, right? Yeah. So where are the aircraft? No, no, we don't get those for another five years. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, at the, probably at the earliest, right? So, so, uh, Windows XP, they're really concerned. Uh, and, uh, well, the, uh, the commander on the car, commander Mark Deller, commander air downplayed any security risk. Apparently he said that the ship is well designed, uh, and there has been a very, very stringent procurement train, and this has ensured we are less susceptible to cyber than most. Mm. Less, not, not no susceptibility, less susceptible. Uh, he said uh, he, would com uh, he would say that compared to the NHS buying computers off the shelf, uh, they're probably better than that, uh, that we should think more in terms of NASA rather than the NHS. I, I find that a really incredible <laughs> statement from a military officer. On, on a key piece of military infrastructure that we're comparing that to a civilian agency in the United States. If right? I, if, yeah, yeah. right, and he, he said, when you buy a ship, you don't buy it today, you bought it 20 years ago, and that's why you're getting 20-year-old computer technology, apparently, because you don't, in your procurement process, make sure that at the end of the day, you've got up-to-date 
uh, technology on board. It's it's twenty year old technology. Well, so so I'm I'm finding so. this this if, more staggering by the minute. If I were Commander Adama from Battlestar Galactica, I would say that that ship is not fit for purpose because uh, it can be hacked. Right. Okay, uh, we're out of time, Pat. We'll just end with this one. Uh, you you were pretty staggered by this. Uh, the Express here is saying 700 new EU laws have been introduced in Britain since the EU referendum and 1,200 more expected before Brexit. Well, I saw this last Thursday, and we didn't cover it in the, the, the latter part of the news cycle on the UK column last week, but this is just unbelievable, Mike. So this is uh, 1,200 expected before Brexit, whenever that is. Could be two years, Mike. Could be two and a half. Maybe, maybe could be never. ten. But uh, see, so how many laws then, or regulations, uh, 1,000 some odd regulations as well? So we're looking at thousands of regulations, possibly thousands of laws passed after the EU referendum of last June. And this was the key point because the British government said, we remain full members of the European Union until the day we leave. Uh, we meet all our obligations during that time. And the Great Reform Bill, uh, sorry, the Great Repeal Bill, which isn't about repealing anything, it's about bringing EU uh, law into domestic law as domestic law, converting it to domestic law. Uh, that will also convert all these new laws and regulations, and they're going flat out to get as many new laws and regulations in as possible before any final agreement on Britain leaving the European Union, which it isn't really going to do anyway. You know, it, it, I'm not surprised to see this story, Mike, because if you remember in the run-up to Brexit, remember how they were framing both the Leave and the Remain campaigns. For the Leave campaign, they made it all about immigration. Immigrants, immigrants, jobs, immigrants, okay? And the, and the same with the Remain. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're going to lose jobs and we're not going to be able to immigrate. This is, this is the real reason, I think, while Middle England voted for Brexit, was for that reason right there. Absolutely. It was because the European uh, superseding the sovereignty of the United Kingdom. And so, because the media had downplayed that aspect of Brexit and why people wanted to vote for Brexit, um, this was just practices of just allowed to continue, unfettered, un unrestrained since yeah. the referendum. Yeah. It really shows more than anything, this story shows what a farce the whole conversation is yes. on Brexit. Uh, Glynis in the chat box saying that she thought that uh, it only applied until we triggered Article 50. I'm afraid that's not the case. Uh, we remain full members of the European Union uh, with all our obligations and we will meet all our obligations until Brexit is signed, sealed and delivered, if it ever is. Uh, and in the meantime, as I say, the Great Repeal Bill brings all that legislation from the European Union and puts it on the British statute books uh, where it becomes considered as UK domestic law. Mm. Yeah. Okay, that's it for today. Thank you very much, Patrick, for joining us. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll be back at the same time, uh, 1 p.m. tomorrow. See you then. Bye-bye.